Welcome to Thursday. I wanted to give you a quick update for next Tuesday. I have three papers listed and I would like you to pick at least two to read. And then during the class on Tuesday, we will discuss all three of these. And then next Thursday, we have a recent PhD graduate from uh, Waterloo who is an expert on crowdsourcing who will be joining us. So I'm pretty excited about that. But today we have Brian Wilder and I pulled up his bio so I can cheat by looking at that. He's at Harvard University and he's advised by Milan Tambay. I did my postdoc with Milan, he's awesome. And he did, Brian did an internship at Microsoft. So at Microsoft, he worked with AJ, who I mentioned uh, on Tuesday, and Eric Horvitz, who we've talked about a few times. And they recently published an Ichkai paper that I found pretty interesting. So I invited Brian here to talk to us about uh, the, the work that he's done, but also to have a larger discussion. And as always, you are welcome to jump into the Brian Wilder Q&A channel to ask questions or just unmute your microphone. Either, either way is fine. So Brian, on, on Tuesday we went and I talked a bit about active learning and we talked about some practical crowdsourcing, but since technology broke, that wasn't recorded. But uh, I think this will give us a pretty good background for you to, you to talk about your paper. Also, I'll mention that the I'll passively aggressively mention that the students have exercise one due next week and I haven't seen any questions in Discord. So I don't know whether everything is going really well or everything is not going at all. So we'll see. But now, why don't I hand it over to Brian? Okay, awesome. Uh, so like, uh, like I mentioned, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about a, a paper um, with, with Eric and AJ that appears in HKI this year um, and Please, yeah, don't hesitate to jump in with, with questions or, or anything like that at, at any point. So the, the title of this paper is, is Learning to Complement Humans. And the, uh, the kind of starting point is um, noticing that in a lot of domains, we seem to be getting to the point where machine learning might be able to function more or less autonomously, or at least we can think of that. Um, and so because it's, it's catching up with or exceeding human performance. And um, one particularly acute example of this is in vision tasks, right? And computer vision um, over the last five years or so has gotten really good and, and is starting to match uh, human level performance in the sense that if you compare, for example, the aggregate performance of a system that diagnoses cancer um, from, from images on an example on a historical data set, human radiologists and labeling those same images, they might actually be fairly close. Um, and so, uh, the question then is, are, could we really allow machines to function entirely independently in some of these domains um, if their performance is getting this good? And so our, we think that the answer for the foreseeable future is no, at least in high stakes domains. And there's a lot of reasons why this could happen. Um, there could be outliers, right? Images that, um, or instances that don't look very much like anything else that you've seen before. Um, you could not have, you could have not enough data to train the model to sort of handle all of the possible contingencies. There could be information or context in your domain that's available only to the human, so the human actually needs to see a different uh, sort of set of input data than the machine does because they have to incorporate other broader context that they know about the situation. Um, and so basically learning to robustly handle kind of all of the possible contingencies in, in a particular domain is, is really hard. And so we think that in, in high stakes domains, um, you know, medicine being one example, but there are many others, we're probably still going to want to have a human in the loop somewhere. Um, we're not going to want to just hand everything off to a completely autonomous system. And so that means... Matt. Hey, Brian, quick question. Um, so, so let's take the, the medicine example. I think that's great motivation that, you know, the, the agent could make mistakes and having a human there is safer. What if the performance of the AI system, autonomous AI system, was actually slightly better than the AI plus human system? Do you, do you think there would still be an appetite for the human AI system because we just trust humans more? Or do you think people would be uh, rational and, and say, well, if I am 0.5% better uh, off with just the AI, I should go with that? I see. So this is a, a, like a hypothetical where adding the human just makes things strictly worse, right? Um, 
Yeah. Um, so my inclination is to think that like this would be weird at first, but we'd probably get used to it. And part of the reason that I think this is that a lot of diagnostic diagnostic tests, like you don't really know anything technologically about how they happen anyway, right? Like if you, um, you know, like if, if you go to get like an antibody test for COVID, right? And someone is like, yeah, we did this like ELISA assay that was, you know, like this like serological thing. And like, I don't know that that's any different than just telling you that like, oh, and AI, you know, told you that you had, that you had COVID. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting point because uh, people complain about AIs being black boxes, but when you go to your doctor, sometimes they do not give you good explanations or they give you an explanation that you don't understand or they might give you an explanation which isn't actually the way they made the decision, but it's the way they rationalize the decision they made. Yeah, and I think some of this has to be, is, is kind of inevitable, right? Because you, I mean, like, it's, it's not really, I, I think reasonable to like explain to me that like, oh, when you, you diagnose me, they, like I have to understand like how an fMRI works or I understand like how, you know, like each individual piece of technology works. Because the point is that these are really complicated and, and specialized. It's like, we have to have like kind of a higher level of explanation where like, given that you accept some amount of black boxness, right? And the underlying technological components, you understand how like, that was put together to come to a diagnosis and a treatment plan. Yeah, that's a good point. Because we'll, we'll never, you're, someone is very unlikely to ever understand something, uh, someone else's decision-making completely, whether it's an agent or a person, there's, there's gonna be some level of abstraction. Yeah, like I think, I think it's more important that like I, I sort of trust that like, you know, the, the clinician has like appropriately taken into account like whatever like information I can give them, you know. Cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so I mean, this is, this is a really interesting scenario to consider. Um, so, so this paper is focused on like the maybe slightly nearer term, um, you know, situation where humans still have kind of something to offer. And, um, and so now I, I want to introduce uh, kind of a way of just kind of like a conceptual framework for thinking about why, you know, it's hard to have perfect learning systems and, and what it means to have kind of trade-offs in, in, where, in where machines are, are better or worse. Um, and so this is, and this is just something that you know, we, like, we just found helpful kind of constructing about the project. And so this is, is the idea of model capacity. Um, and so the idea here is that when you, when you think about the, the input space of your problem, right, like the feature space of, you know, all possible, you know, I guess in this case, all possible, um, you know, images of, of, of biopsy slides for cancer detection, um, models really can't be accurate, you know, everywhere across the entire possible space of inputs, at least without a pretty high price. And um, and the reason for that is that you can, you're generally limited in the capacity of the model that you can train for. We think of capacity as roughly being how complicated a function the model is, is capable of representing. Um, so here's just like a simple like example kind of, you know, curve fitting exercise. So we have a function f of x, and let's say that we want to approximate f of x with, with a model. Now, if I tell you that um, you can only use, use linear models, right, which of course are, are very simple, have, have just two parameters in this domain, then uh, you know, you can you can try example line segments here, right? But there there is no no linear fit that actually like accurately describes f of x everywhere in the domain. Um, you would you would need you know maybe a quadratic function that has additional parameters to get sort of a more plausible fit everywhere. And of course, in this in this really simple example, you can just say like, yeah, of course you should have used a quadratic. That's, that's not a linear function. Um, but um, in general, this this always comes back to bite you somewhere, right? This is basically the the bias variance trade off in machine learning that high capacity models are, you know, precisely because they're so flexible and so overly parameterized, are able to really easily overfit spurious trends in the data. Um, and so that means that um, for a given data set size, you cannot, like, uh, you can't fit arbitrarily high capacity models because you won't be able to actually tell which high capacity model is the best one from the limited data that you have. And so uh, taking the data as, as fixed, then there's some limit, and uh, we're not going to formalize any of this, but we're just, I'm going to, to think of it as there, there, is, there is some limit on, on the capacity of the model that you can reasonably train. And so that means that in, you know, assuming that your domain is reasonably complex, the prediction problem is not that easy. That means that inevitably there's going to be some regions of the space where your model is better or worse. And, um, and so that means that, uh, that we kind of have to make some trade-offs, right? The model is going to have to pick, you know, I'd rather focus doing better on these instances. And it's okay if that means that I lose the capacity to represent um, you know, like the, the important details for this other set of instances. Um, and 
Um, and this is, you know, unfortunate that, you know, we can't sort of perform well everywhere, um, but it also gives us an opportunity because it means that um, just controlling the distribution of where errors occurs gives us kind of another level, uh, another level, right, that we can pull beyond um, just kind of simple accuracy, right? We can we can ask that the model focus on some on some instances versus others in a way that benefits you know, the overall um, objective that we're trying to achieve. So uh, typically, we don't actually make this trade off in a very uh, kind of specific way. So the way that this trade off uh, happens in you know in an operational level is that you have a loss function during training, and so the training process is, is trying to minimize that loss function on the training data um, for, your, for your model. And usually the loss function just weights all the errors. Right? You just say, I want to minimize mean squared error. And that's the mean over all of the data points. So all, all errors count equally towards the final loss that you're trying to minimize. And in that case, you'll get a more or less kind of arbitrary solution, right? It's, you know, you'll get a like a loss minimizing solution, but one, but which one you get mostly just depends on kind of whatever the inductive biases of your model are and like the exact contingencies of the training process, um, because that's all you really asked for. You didn't ask for anything in more in more detail. And so the the question is whether this is actually the best that we can do. And I mean, there's a reason this is a really common thing to do. Maybe it's the best that you can do if you only have the ML system because you know you don't have any reason to prefer, uh, you know, to, to distinguish between models that have the same level of accuracy and aggregate. Uh, but the question that we want to ask in, in this paper is what happens if the AI gets to team up with a human? Um, and so now the maybe the model doesn't have to be equally good at everything because it can ask the human for help when it's not totally sure. And so the, the questions that we want to get at in, in this paper are, you know, how do we decide, you know, when, when to ask the human for help, when to, when to create the human, and how does just the ability um, just having the human in the loop there, um, how should that train change the way that we train the model in the first place? I have a question about that. Is um is the human being asked, is that for training or is that for use of the model? Yeah, good question. So so we're so we're thinking of this that actually at test time you have the ability to like in, in deployment, you can you can ask a human for it, not just during training. And so and then during training, we're going to simulate that by assuming that we have kind of historical data for like human response. Yeah, and, and so the you know kind of this this I'll have this as a running example. You know, if I if I have a system that's, that's trying to classify cancer from images, when does it decide to actually call over a radiologist and ask them, you know, to you know it's it's not quite sure what's going on here, you know, and, and you decide to move in. So in in this paper, um, what we're, the essential idea that we're trying to show is that the decision of when to create the human expert and how to train the ML model should not actually be posed as separate questions. That these, these should be linked together and that the way that we train the model um, should depend on the decisions of when we're going to, to create the human and not. And in particular, um, given that our model has limited capacity, it should be trying to focus that capacity on instances where the human is less accurate, right? Because if the human is really good at, at a particular set of instances, then the model doesn't have to worry as much about them because it knows that, you know, perhaps at, at some cost, it, it, can, it can ask for help on those instances. And so really we should be trying to think about optimizing the utility of the team as a whole, not just the accuracy of the, of the model in isolation. So that's the, the overall strategy of, of the paper here. Um, I'm going to now get into more of like the details of, of how we set this up. Um, but are there any questions about the kind of high level goals here before we do that? One, one thing we mentioned on Tuesday was talking about ensemble methods, in particular, thinking about how for active learning, if you had an ensemble, you could query by committee. And then if there's lots of disagreement, ask for help. I like, I like your motivation here of saying, you know, the model can't be, is not gonna be perfect everywhere. And maybe you can have the human help. Could you, al could you also do this with an ensemble approach and have multiple machine learning algorithms? Or is that not really applicable because you're, you're using the human to cover instances that just no model is going to learn. Yeah, so, so I think there's, it, these are definitely really closely related concepts. I, I think they're, they're slightly different um, for a couple of reasons. One is that is, yeah, that we think of the human as 
really being able to do something that's kind of like orthogonal from what's easily learnable about the problem. At least that's, that's the motivation. Um, and the second is that typically, I think in ensembling, there is very little cost to evaluating additional models on the problem. Um, so some algorithms will actually just evaluate all of the models, get all of their predictions, and then do whatever coding thing to combine them. And here, um, so I haven't introduced this yet, but we're going to think of there being some cost of, of talking to the, to the human. You know, that you actually have to you know, spend the time of an expert who can only do so many things. And so you would like to avoid working them on, on kind of every instance. Cool, thank you, that helps me. Yeah, the thing I want to ask is, um, I guess you're gonna cover more of this, but I feel like there's some strong assumptions that are gonna be made on how smart this human is or what exactly he's good at, as opposed to um, what the agent's good at and what, they, what he can actually, like what the agent can trust from the human. Yeah, yeah, so the, uh, this, is, this is a good point. Um, and so we, we don't like, formalize a set of assumptions, where right? we just you know, give a, a training method that we think should be able to kind of extract most of the benefit out of interacting with the human regardless of, of what their, their capabilities are. Um, but I, th I think you're right that this is going to be beneficial really strongly under specific conditions where the human is, is basically, like is, is genuinely offering something that's complementary to what's learnable by the machine. Um, and that the, the machine has some way of, of recognizing like when those instances appear that the human might be good at, even if it can't tell exactly what the agent's is. And, and we see some example of that in, in sort of real domains, um, but it's, it's definitely not like we're guaranteed that this is going to happen. I guess kind of, I don't know if this is exactly tied to the previous question, but like wouldn't a limitation maybe of this kind of approach be that each model is kind of almost unique to the person that it's interacting with. So like, you know, the things that I, like you or I might know are very different. And so the models we learn, like you'd always kind of always have to be adapting to different people. So it's not maybe possible to like learn a single model that would like generalized knowledge that works for multiple people. Is that a problem that is a concern in this paper or like out of scope? or just yeah. completely unrelated? No, this is definitely related and it's, it's a really interesting point. So we, we made the kind of deliberate decision to not focus on this kind of, I guess, personalization aspect. Um, so we're training the model against a kind of population of users, right? And um, so you have like, like a sort of interchangeable like pool of radiologists and every time you ask for help, you just get kind of like a random draw from, um, from one of these people. Um, and then you have training data that reflects that setting, right? That you have, you have data from multiple humans interacting with the task. Um, and so we're not trying to customize the model to the strengths of a particular person, but this is definitely, I think, like an interesting, like a really interesting topic for future work, right? Maybe you start out with this kind of, you know, kind of generalist model, and then if it's going to interact a lot with a specific person, then it, it sort of learns to adapt to them specifically over time. And then it, the uh, model could also learn over time who to fire. <laughs> Uh, so we'll keep going now. Um, so, so introducing now the, the just kind of breaking down a little bit more of the workflow that we're going to be thinking about. So we're going to have uh, when an instance comes in, it's going to be seen first by what we'll call a meta model that decides: Do I want to query the human on this instance, or do I want just want to pass this to the machine itself? And so that routes the the instance one of two ways. In, in the upper branch, it goes just to the machine learning model. The machine learning model outputs a prediction. Um, you know, often these, these could be soft predictions, right? You know, like a lot of methods will actually output some, you know, um, some probability that it's in either class. Um, and then in this case, maybe we would threshold it. Yeah, yeah, I think this is instance one, but you know, the model isn't like really, you know, very confident about this by itself because the class probabilities are, are relatively close together. Um, and then on the other branch, if the metal model decides to ask for human help, then you get a label from the human. And so the human says, I think that this is class one. And then the model gets to make a prediction seeing both the features and the label from the human. And so the model at this point is allowed to disagree with the human, right? If it for some reason thinks that the answer that the human gave is like really implausible, it could, it could do something different. Um, but you know, we kind of expect that in, in most cases, it's, you know, having the human give an input is going to kind of increase the probability that on, on 
on whatever the human says. Um, but, but the model decides how to synthesize together these, these pieces of information. And so the kind of, I guess, probably standard um, way for constructing systems like this that, that we'd seen in the literature was that you're going to optimize basically the machine only accuracy part here when you're training the model. So you're going to start out by assuming that there is no human in the loop. We're just going to train the most accurate model that we can. And then afterwards, we'll, we'll train the, the metamodel policy that, that decides how to route the instances here, taking as, as given whatever ML model we have. And so the approach that we wanted to investigate in this paper is whether we can do better with the sort of end-to-end -end training framework that um, we train the model jointly with the metamodel um, kind of you know, with the, with the utility that depends on the outcomes in both of these paths. So we really want to, to train it just to optimize the final utility of the team as a whole, not just the individual performance of the, of the machine learning model. Um, so, to, um, so to kind of formalize this um, slightly, um, we're going to have instances that consist of an input X, which is the features of the problem. So maybe this is the, you know, like the image of, of the slide. Um, and then there's a true label that we don't know ahead of time, which is, which is why. Um, and so, and then the ML system decides whether it wants to see a human label that I'll call H. And we'll have a function Q for query, which um, it depends on the features X. And that's one if it decides to query the human and zero otherwise. Um, like I alluded to earlier, there's some cost to querying the human. So, uh, so if we set Q to one and we observe H, then we have to pay a cost C. And then um, given whatever information is available, the model makes prediction y hat. And this is a function of, so then m here is the model, and this is a function of either just the input features or both the features and the label of the human. And the final utility that we get is, um, you know, some utility function that measures, um, you know, how much we like predicting y hat when the true answer was y. Um, so this measures somehow the accuracy of our prediction. And then um, and then uh, C times whether we query to the human or not. So this gives, or I'm oh, sorry, sorry, that should be a, a minus sign. So we, we lose utility C if we decide to query the human. Um, so does this way of uh, writing things down make sense? Does this mean, or can the utility or the cost change? Because I could see, you know, at diagnostics changing and the cost of a false negative gets lower, doctors get more expensive, so the cost gets higher. I see. So, um, so actually, like over the over the the course of the model being used, right? You're asking it like at some points in time, the utility function might be different. Yeah, you do you do a bunch of training, you deploy the system, and then uh, U or C changes. Do you have to? Uh, do you have to redo everything or can you just kind of roll with it? Uh, so I think this depends on exactly how you set up the system. So, because we, we look at a couple of families of approaches in the paper. And so I'll, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll point this out as we get to them. I think one family of approach can probably do something intelligent even if you changes at, at test time, though you, you might still benefit from your training if you would have the ability to. Uh, sorry, so I have a quick question. So during inference, you query, you do the querying thing first, and then you you make a decision based on either MX or MXH. Is that correct? Yes. And so if you query the human during learning, then you, like, if your utility cancels out with, uh, oh, I see. Okay. Okay. So if you query, you get punished, essentially. The model gets punished if you, if you query. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you have to think that you're getting at least like C additional utility and expectation by querying. I see, method. okay. And sorry, that, that's an interesting point, is that you are going to get C utility on this one decision, or you think you, because you now get this extra human label in expectation over until the end of time, you will achieve C utility because your model has improved. Yeah, this is also an interesting question. And we, de we deliberately limited the, the scope for this paper to be settings where um, you, know, you sort of train upfront once with a set of historical data, and then after that, the model is unchanged. Um, so there's all the instances are independent. There's no benefit from seeing additional information for later instances. Um, but this is absolutely a setting that you could consider. Got it. Right, and so the, the training data that we're going to assume we get access to here is a set of instances where we get to see the ground truth label 
And then we also get to see a sampled human response. And here the human is not necessarily perfect, right? So they, their label may or may not agree with, with the ground truth lie. Um, and this is a little bit tricky to get in some domains because sometimes we, like the way that we get the ground truth label is just asking a human. Um, and so it's not obvious how to, how to separate these from each other. Um, and so this is really like most applicable when you, um, like a common setup is, is that the, the ground truth label is, pr is produced by like a panel of, of human responses, right? So you get multiple people to label the same thing and then take their majority vote or whatever, but there, there will be some deviation from whatever the, the ground truth label is among the individual responses. And so, Sorry, so then like your H1 is maybe noisier than your ground truth, just inherently since it's assumed, I guess in how you described it, it's a single person's viewpoint? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like we, like we think it's it's correlated somehow with, with Y, for sure. It gives you information about the label, and it's, there's addition in this, and just whatever that particular human decides to tell you. Okay, I don't know. That, that seems like a fundamental weakness. Um, I don't want to like, it's, this is a very interesting thing, I don't, but like that seems at least with how you've explained it, like a big issue from my end, but like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna judge too harshly because you like, but. Yeah, so, so, so it, it's a limitation that, um, that we assume that H is noisier than Y. I guess, I don't know, because I guess if Y is like a stronger label, but I guess, yeah, never, I'll just stop talking and just, okay, sure. Well, but could you, could you also think of it as, I, I'm going to predict whether this person dies of breast cancer in the next year, and then they either die of breast cancer, they die of something else, which tells you nothing, or they don't die of breast cancer. So in some sense, you, you could get the true label, and then H would always be noisier than Y. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. I, I think that's the, the idealized setting, right, where you have some way to completely observe Y, and then, okay. and then by implication, H must always be noisier, and then sometimes, yeah, the actual data that we have isn't quite that nice because Y is somehow also constructed from like a proxy. Okay. Um, um, so now, um, this is, okay, yeah, so this is interesting. So, so Matt, I, I know that we had, we had talked about having kind of a breakout question. Um, I think that would happen around this point in the in the talk. I do not actually see the slide here. Um, I, don't know if I accidentally deleted it or something, but this this would be a great point. <laughs> well, so what? So we could have uh, people jump into a breakout room for five minutes, ten minutes. What would what would you prefer? Uh, yeah, I mean anything anything in that range. I think. Okay, and what and what should the outcome of this breakout room discussion be? Uh, so my my recollection was that we were. Um, this this was going to be a point to to think a little bit about potential approaches to the to the problem, right? Like what are what are features that such a system sh should uh, should look for in deciding, you know, when to query the human or or not? Okay, awesome. So we've got we've got this setting where we have inputs, outputs, which could be a little bit noisy, or true labels, which could be a little bit noisy, and the human. And now the system needs to decide: Am I going to make a decision just on my own? Or am I going to pay for the human to help me make a decision? Is, is that the right framing? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, so what I, what I would like people to do is I'm going to throw you into breakout rooms for five minutes. And then one person in that breakout room uh, should be in charge of writing something down. And then when the five minutes is up, we can drop those uh, ideas into Discord and discuss. So I will see you back in five. I can uh, voice a question. We had Brian in our group, so I cheated a little bit and I, I've already had it answered. But I was asking about um, if it would be equivalent or fair at all, instead of actually going through the pool of data to see what the humans normally said on a, on a particular input, just to treat it as um, the human is right 80% of the time. So when the model wants to query the humans, then it has some cost and then it will get the right answer 80% of the time. And uh, my understanding of the answer I got was it's not quite 
uh, fair to do something like that because you don't know what the distri distribution is like in the areas that you're asking. So it might be overall that the humans are getting it correct 80% of the time, but all the ones that the model is asking the humans, maybe they're 100% right or 50% right. It's not a, you can't just universally go with, with a number like that because they, they might always be asking tricky questions or, or very easy questions. Yeah, it sounds like we could almost, or should almost model the human at that point. Hmm. Yeah, so a, an even simpler example, if, if we were doing classification, not binary classification, but four class, class classification, and it turns out the humans were just always bad at class one. If you could do that kind of high level modeling, it seems like it might be useful. But I bet there's cases where it's it's more or less easy to, to model humans in that way. So let's see. So we got a, a bunch of uh, responses in Discord. Thank you for that. So the first one was saying, well, we could, there's three cases where we could query a human when the model is not confident in the prediction. So maybe some threshold randomly, as random queries might improve the model. And the third one is where the human says they should be asked. So for instance, after you query, in addition to querying the human, you could also ask the human, was this a good place for me to query you? Yeah, the, right. the, the, the last one's a, a really cool suggestion. This isn't something that, that we thought of, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious em empirically, like how, how good practitioners at some of these domains are at assessing their, their own uncertainty. You know, like, can they, can they tell you like, yeah, that, like I'm really sort of, like, I feel very confident about this, this prediction, you know, I, I think I gave you the right answer or will they say like, ah, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not totally sure. Maybe like, I didn't give you that much information here. Um, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add beyond that, but I, I think it's a cool suggestion. Yeah, and one person saying they would likely overestimate their, their aptitude. So I think it's something like 80% of US drivers think they're above average car drivers. Um, okay, so those were uh, three heuristics. And then there was, the next one was have a simple model uh, to, to decide when to ask a human. Um, that would be one, try to learn that model. Another one would be predetermine what values are troublesome by humans. So if you know what humans are bad at, that could be useful. And enable the model to query more than one person. Interesting. So if I had, if I, if I had a particularly important decision, then maybe you would want to query more than one person. So, um, so it sounds like the second, well, I don't know, I was, I was trying to say whether these, these are really heuristics or if these are more quantitative things. And I think some of these are quantitative. Um, okay, then uh, defer to the human when the ML system is low confidence. Um, cluster incorrect instances to try to detect common types of mistakes. Defer to the human if the instance falls into problematic cluster. Or think about um, zones, input uh, space zones where the human might be better versus the AI. So this is again modeling uh, our, the AI system and the human and trying to figure out who's better, who's better than the other one. Um, let's see, and then the last one, look at past responses. And if the probability of getting a right answer is more than 50%, then the AI could query the human. But the AI should also take into account there's a 50% probability that the human right be, might be right this time. So I, I think I'm not understanding that last one. Could, could someone hop on and kind of explain the thinking behind it? Um, yeah, sure. So whenever the AI is uncertain about anything, it can probably look at the past responses by the human. And if it, it sees that there is a 50% probability that the person is right, I mean, uh, the person is right in like 50% of the cases, then it could probably decide to query the human. I mean, the ideology is something like that. So if, if, if it's binary classification and the humans were right 50% of the time, then that makes the human useless. Because uh, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, let's not talk about a binary classification, maybe. Okay. Yeah. So then if you know how likely the human is to be right, and if you know how likely you are to be right, maybe you could use that? Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see, another idea, look at how closely the expert's answer is to what the model would have done. So is that, this is kind of a retrospective thing. So I either decide to ask the expert or not. And then once, when I ex ask the expert, then I found out whether this was useful after the fact. Okay, I'm seeing some nods. Um, cool. Yeah, so that's that's uh, censored training data. So you're, uh, you could also think about uh, randomly asking the expert and then after that, trying to figure out where was it that asking actually helped. And then it, this, I think this could be framed as an exploration versus exploitation problem, uh, particularly if the model's learning over time. All right, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna be quiet. And Brian, was, was there anything in there that you'd like to respond to or would you like to keep going? Um, oh, sorry, there's one more. Oh, no, there's there, people are having all good ideas. Um, so thinking about you could model the human's confidence, you know, so the human could give you an estimate of, of his or her confidence, or you could try to model it, you could learn it, that could absolutely go into it. Now, now I'll be quiet, I'll even mute myself. Yeah, so these are, these are all really cool ideas. Um, I think, so like what we decided to do falls somewhere in the spectrum of you know, develop a model of the human, um, you know, calculate the expected utility for creating them versus versus not um, identify feature regions where model, each model is more or less good, sort of that family of responses. Um, but a lot of the, the other responses, I think, you know, pick up on things that are really like limitations of like the particular way that like we decided to to formalize the problem here, right? You know, so things like, like the ability to ask a human about their own uncertainty or to query multiple humans if it's a particularly sort of important instance um, this online setting where you, you interact with the human and, and improve the model over time. Um, these are all really, really cool ideas that I think, um, and we've, we've talked at least a, about a couple, at least a couple of them kind of as, as potential future work. And there are definitely things I would like to see happen. Um, but uh, with that, yeah, let me, let me get the screen share set up again. Okay, um, so now I'll, I'll tell you um, a little bit about um, what, what we happen to do in, in this particular paper, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end to come back and, and think about um, other, other interesting things that you can do to fix some implementations. Um, so in, in this paper, we, we think uh, about two different uh, families of approaches, um, discriminative and decision theoretic, um, which represent kind of two like broad ways in the literature of thinking about how to approach um, the style of problem. And then for both of them, we introduce a kind of uh, twist on the standard training method that, that makes it into kind of this end-to-end -end method that optimizes the utility of the team as a whole. Um, so uh, these two classes, um, the first discriminative is um, just learning a mapping from X to whatever you're going to do, right? So you just have like a function that you learn that takes in the input and then says like, yes, query, no, don't query, and here's the label the machine is going to guess. Um, and then the decision theoretic um, has a little bit more kind of like structure, you know, besides just the, that learned model. Um, so it tries to explicitly reason about the expected utility of querying versus not querying, right? So it's going to represent, you know, the probability that it thinks the, the machine is right, the probability that the human is, it, you know, would give you, you know, a particular response that's right or wrong on this instance. Um, and then use that to, to ask explicitly about the sort of value of information for querying the human. So, um, and I'll, I'll make these a little bit more concrete as we as we move through these two categories. So starting out with the discriminative methods. Um, so here, the way that these are kind of architected is uh, that the instance comes in, you have, uh, you know, uh, some function approximator, you know, possibly a neural network that looks at it, tells you query or not query, and then um, and then you have additional learned models that take whichever inputs are available and maps that to a decision. Um, so this is just like a, 
a very you know straightforward way of setting this sort of thing up. You know, it probably takes like three lines and you know whatever your favorite like learning like machine learning library is, and um, and so uh, typically the way that we would maybe approach training this is to kind of train all of these pieces individually, right? So I can have um, starting out on the on the right hand side here with the the models that predict the the labels. You know, I can have a historical data set that you know one data set that has both the 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 input features and the human as kind of the combined features of the problem. You know, train a model to predict the label from those. Train another model that gets just to, that only gets to see the the, label, the features x. And then once I have those, then I can train sort of another binary classifier basically that decides um, you know whether to to route the instance to the human or, or to the machine. Where the the loss function from that binary classifier is just induced by the accuracy of the of the, the models that we already trained. And um, and so then uh, the uh oh the, the approach that we had is yep. to Brian's back. relax. So so oh. Br Brian, you cut out for right at the beginning of this slide. Got it. Okay, so the the alternative that we propose in this paper is to at least at training time relax the, the query policy here to to a probability and then uh and then we, we can have a, a a combined loss function that lets us train all of the models simultaneously so the nice thing is that once uh once q becomes uh probabilistic then if i if i write all of these models down um i can I can have a loss function that combines both of these paths, right? Where the loss that you get in, in the top path is weighted by 0.7, and the loss that you get in the bottom path is weighted by 0.3. And now I have a loss function that's differentiable in terms of all the internal parameters of, of all of the models. And again, this is really easy to implement. You can just you know, tell PyTorch to, to do this for you and, um, and, and jointly optimize the parameters of, of all of the models together. Um, and uh, right, and, and that's that's it really. So um, I'm, I'm not going to claim that this paper is like super technically complicated. Um, so there, there's a technical question. Um, mm -hmm. Is Qx, uh, uh, Q of X passed as input to the other models? Um, so it's it's not, um, but um, oh, that's actually interesting. Um, because so my, my initial reaction was that you're not learning anything by, by seeing Q of X because, um, you know, each model knows that it's, it's called only sort of conditional on that decision going, going its way. Um, but you're right during the, the kind of fractional, like in the fractional realization here that maybe you actually have some additional information by knowing what Q was um, that we're like more or less confident that the human is good at this, um, this instance, for example. Um, and so in theory, the, the two, like you're not, um, you don't need to give Q of X as input because it's also just a function of X, right? So the, the downstream models could recompute that function and then do whatever they need to do with that information, but it's, it's possible that this would help speed up training. Is this stable? Because it seems like you have two points of gradients flowing through from two different losses. So which one do you update first or do you like add the gradients together or? Uh, yeah, so, so the, the great, so we, we get a single gradient of you know, the gradient of the combined loss with respect to all the parameters, and that gradient will, will sum out over the different paths. Sorry, now I'm confused too. So if if you, you flip the coin and you decide to ask the human, then you go through the upper neural network, and then you could back propagate through the neur neural network on the upper right and the one on the left. You could also, if you get the human input, you could choose to ignore it, and go through the lower right network and back propagate through the lower right network and the network on the left. So if you ask the human, you could uh, update all three. If you do not ask the human, then you could only update two, the lower right and the left. Am I thinking about this the right way? Um, so I, I think the important thing here is that we assume during training, you have access to, the, to this log human response. So you can just simulate both pathways. Um, Oh, this uh, sorry. So this is during training. You are getting all of you're getting you're getting the pseudo human response every time. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, David. Does that answer your question, or are you asking a different uh, question? A different question, because you're so the output Q X is going through two separate networks, 
right? So like what happens to, you know, you get, you get gradients from two, you get outputs from those two separate networks and you have a loss function for both of them, right? So then what happens at the, like, at the left part there? Yeah, so from the perspective of, of Q here, um, so the, in, in each of those branches, we get some kind of, you know, we, we get some loss for each individual branch, right? That's based on whether Y hat in that branch was accurate. And then we also has that has the penalty C in, in the top branch where we create the human. So now we have a loss for each branch. And still from the perspective of Q or whatever is parameterizing Q, um, we, at, at any given iteration, those losses in the individual branches do not depend on Q, right? Because they're produced by an, another set of parameters. And so now the gradient of the loss with respect to Q is just that, um, you know, Q weights whether we get the better or worse loss or the worse loss, basically. Okay. Does that make sense? A, a kind of. It's fine. I'll, I'll, I'll read the paper uh, maybe later or something. <laughs> so is it kind of fair to say, I guess, the gradient for the Q model is just weighted by the losses from the other ones? Yeah. Okay. Uh, does that mean we have something like a 0 0.7 times one loss plus 0 0.3 times another loss in the uh, total loss function? Or yeah, from the perspective of of Q, that's that's all that happens. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. One one more picky question. Um, there are two neural networks on on the right. Are those actually two neural networks, or are they one neural network where you're showing different inputs? Uh, so in in this implementation, they are actually two networks because I didn't want to deal with like the current networks that <laughs> take variable sized inputs. Um, okay. So then, I, why, why does the uh, why do both of these networks have three inputs in instead of two and one. Oh, uh, sorry, because I took like a stock picture of the neural network. Um, oh, okay. And did, did not vary the number of inputs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Couldn't you just set like a, like a placeholder value for H and then just have the same network? Uh, like yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah that, that would have been a completely reasonable thing to try. Uh, any more questions about this setting? Okay. Um, so then the, the decision theoretic setting um, here, remember I told you that we're going to, to try to explicitly sort of then calculate the expected utility of both of these options. And, um, and so then the, the kind of key thing that we're trying to compute here is what's called the value of information. So the idea here is that we want to explicitly um, compute our, our expected utility in each scenario, where the expected utility taking first, you know, the option of not querying is the utility that we would get under our optimal prediction in expectation over what the true label is, given, right? So the, the inner sum here is the probability of each scenario for what the true label could be, and then our utility in that scenario, if we guess why. And that gives us the utility of, of guessing each particular y hat, and then I take the best y hat overall. And that gives me my, my expected utility for, for not querying. And so the key thing here is this um, P of y given x, which is um, a, a probabilistic model for what the label would be given the data that we saw. And so basically, um, you can think of this as kind of related to like then how, how sharply concentrated that probability distribution is, is related to like how confident the model is. Um, then on the, on the right-hand side then is the expected utility if we decide to query. And so here um, we have this kind of additional expectation wrapping around the same kind of expression where we're, um, first we have a model for the human given the data. So this is you know, P of H given X. And so because before I query, I don't know what the human is going to say. Um, but if I have a model of the human, then that gives me a probability distribution over what their response might be. And then I can simulate sort of in each of those scenarios where the human tells me, oh, it's label one, it's label two, and so on. Um, given that, the, that that's what the human said, I can ask for now the conditional distribution of the label given both the features and that particular response by the human. 
And so, and then the, so the indirect expression in, inside the expectation is, is the same sort of thing. Right now I'm saying, um, you know, what's my, the utility of my best decision in expectation over what the label might be given the information that I got from both of these sources. Um, so that, that's the overall breakdown. Um, do we, do we want to stop? Are there other questions about how these are set up? So I think, I think I understand how this is working. So you're trying to calculate the value of information. Um, but then when you started talking about the model of the human, if I've got a good model of the human, why do I need to query the human? If I don't have a good model of the human, then how will this be useful? Yeah, so, um, so this is a good question. Um, so I, I think in all of these cases, the, the problem is that your, your prob like all of these probability distributions, if your model was perfect, they would pick out like the single true thing as you know, having probability one. Um, but it's very likely the case that given the information you have, you can't identify the correct thing. And so your probability distribution would be spread out across multiple possible things. You're, you're not totally sure which one would, yeah, you know, like what response the human would actually give, and you need to ask them to find out. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the same way with the, with the distribution of the label, right? You can say, oh, if I have the probability distribution of the label, why do I ever need to see the label itself? And it's because you don't have enough information to know what the true label is actually is. So your, your distribution of the label is, um, is, is, is dispersed over multiple values. Okay, I think I think I get that. Other questions while we're, while we're paused here? That sounds like a no to me. Let's carry on. Okay, um, so so here are the, so, so this lets us calculate expected utilities. And then, you know, of course we can decide just to, to base our query decision on which, which option has higher expected utility for us. And, the, and so the key ingredient to, to make this work here, of course, is producing these probabilistic models for you know, each of the components of the system. Right. Um, so the, the kind of classical ML, ML model is P of Y given X, right? Just the, the conditional probability of the label given the inputs. But now with the human of the loop, we need, we also need probabilistic models of these other components of the system. We need a model of the human themselves, and we need a model of the label conditional on both pieces of information. And the reason that I'm writing these, these models with, with the subscripts alpha, beta, and gamma is that these, these probability models are going to have some internal parameterization, right? And by internal parameterization, I mean, it's going to be another neural network that spits out what the probability is, and, uh, and that network has its own, you know, its own weights and so on. And so uh, we're going to try to find the values of alpha, beta, and gamma that results in, in you know, good, good probabilistic models. So you, uh, I have a quick question. You might have said this already, but do you have multiple models of the human? That's that probability of the human given the data, and you take the expectation over that? Uh, so so there's, there's only one model of the human, which gives the probability of each of the possible responses for the human. And, and we take the expectation over those probabilities. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so, so now the, the question for, for training is, you know, how do we actually produce these, these models in the most effective way possible? Um, and um, in a very idealized sense, I guess, um, this wouldn't really be a question, right? You would just be like a perfect Bayesian and um, you would be able to you know, completely accurately compute your posterior distribution over all of these quantities, and they would just be whatever they, they are. Um, but the, that's not the world that we live in. We have to represent these somehow with, with actual functions that we train um, that can be more or less accurate. And so the, um, and so the approach that we propose is to have a, a kind of an, an end-to-end way of training all of, all of these probabilistic models for, for the best overall accuracy where we basically replace all of the hard maxes with, with soft maxes. Um, there's a little bit more kind of notation and stuff in the paper, but that's really all that's happening. Um, and once we, once we do that, um, Q becomes differentiable with respect to all of the underlying probabilistic models here, um, because these are, these are all differentiable functions. And so now, um, 
you know, all of the outputs of the system are differentiable in terms of the internal parameterization of all the probabilistic models. And, um, and now I can, I can train them all together um, like I did in the, in the discriminative setting, except that there's this kind of additional structure in the loop that we're actually like simulating the expected utility calculations in every Walmart pass. Um, so I'll, I'll pause here again. So is this just like the, I think like, what is it, concrete distribution or whatever, like the straight through idea where you have discrete distributions and you're pretending, let's just say they're continuous so you can have this gradient, I guess. I don't know if that means anything to you, but. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 so it's a similar like, like I guess philosophical motivation. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're okay. right that we're just gonna like pretend this discrete thing is continuous during training. Um, the, the actual mechanics are a little bit different because the, con the concrete distribution is aimed at uh, settings where you actually have to like sample like a quasi discrete action. Um, and here we, we don't have to have that process of sampling. We just have to see some out over all the expected utilities. Okay, um, so that's, that's it for the details of, of our approach. And I'm going to now uh, you know, briefly talk about kind of the, the experiments that we did to, to see whether this, this all works. Um, so we looked at, at a couple of domains. One is this kind of you know, funny example of breast cancer detection. Um, and so there's data provided by the Chameleon Challenge um, where you know, there's a bunch of slides and, and, and they also had labels by humans. And then they were kind enough to also, when we asked, send us the complete panel responses because they actually had a big set of, of I think, um, 15 different, different doctors you know, label each, um, each of the images. And so they sent us the individual responses to, to give us the log training data. Um, and then there's often disagreement between some of the, the individual humans um, that were then resolved by, by a sort of ground truth evaluator who spent a lot of time on it to, to produce the, the final label. Um, so, so that's the first domain. And then the second domain is a, is a citizen science um, domain. So this is the, the Galaxy Zoo project where we're trying to classify galaxies into one of six or so different kinds um, from, from images. And we're doing this with crowdsourced labels. So people um, have the ability to just log onto the system, watch a, like a little tutorial, and then start, you know, providing, um, you know, classifications on, on galaxies that they're shown. And, uh, and this, so then here, there's a pretty wide distribution of skill levels because some people are, you know, really like experts. They're, they're very into this and, and extremely good. And some people are just, are, you know, relatively new and, and provide noise levels. And so we have like a, a big log data set of, of human responses to some of these tasks. And then the ground truth is, um, is when the system decides to, to retire an image after it has enough labels. You know, maybe after, the, after it gets 30 or so labels, it's, it decides it, it, we know what the true label is. Um, so I'm not going to show like a ton of the individual plots and tables and stuff because I don't think that's very interesting. Um, we, obviously, like I wouldn't be giving this talk if the intent method didn't work. Um, the kind of key takeaway here is that um, for all of these, like all of these colors are, are different setups. Um, for, for, for one of the approaches and the number of layers in the model. And, um, and then the dashed line is if you train the models all individually, and then the, the solid line is if you train them together end to end, and the solid line is lower, meaning it's lower plus. Um, so array is like, it, it, it does something. We're, we're at least somewhat better off for having trained the models together. Um, and this is what we would kind of hope to see because we got to jointly optimize the, the end loss that's being measured in this plot, so hopefully it's better. Um, and um, you know the, the work I guess would be that yeah you know, like the training is too difficult or something like that. we're not able to, to actually optimize the loss function well um, but, but happily things things do seem to work out reasonably well. Is there um, another way? Uh, sorry, sorry if I'm no, um, interrupting. Is there another way to like uh, judge how well like um, joint versus fixed does as opposed to just like a loss? purely based on like looking at the loss um, uh, because like from experience like losses they they might not mean too much uh depending on like a whole bunch of different factors right so like is there like a plot for like total performance or something um sorry, what, what do you mean by performance uh just like on the data set itself like um yeah because so you you're you get the utility minus cost. So you could think about going through the entire data set 
and just plotting, uh, adding up all of the utility minus costs you get. And that would be a number. Yeah, instead of like loss, because loss in this case is a bit, you know, yeah, just looking at machine learn like machine learning model losses, I don't feel like is at least uh, personally right. from experience. I'm not sure if that's like indicative, but maybe it's different in this case. I'm not uh, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, sorry, there's a just like terminological thing I should have clarified here. So by by total loss here in in, in the paper, we we mean exactly what Matt said, like utility minus or like the negative of utility minus cost. Okay. Um, okay. I see. So the optimal place is like the bottom left corner. Yes. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, I, I did not do a good job of actually introducing this figure. So, um, so, so the, the x-axis here is, is the cost, say, to query the human. So like, as you fix that parameter of the problem, then, then how, how well does each method do? And so we expect that when the querying the human is free, everyone does better, right? Um, right, OK. Um, is there any explanation? Oh, uh, yeah, what the deal with the flat line at the top is? Is it actually flat, or is that just like optical illusion? Uh, no, it's actually like pretty flat up to some sampling error. And the reason for this is that the, um, the deeper um, discriminative models, so like once they had more than one layer per each of the individual models, um, they just like did not train properly with the human input at all. Like they could not figure out how to query the human appropriately. Like the, so the machine learning model had reasonable accuracy by itself, um, but it just made like completely uninformed decisions about when to ask for human input and didn't really use the human. And I spent a while on this and really just could not figure out why this was happening. I guess, does that kind of fit into what you were saying at the start of the talk with like, the model had too much capacity. And so I don't know, like, so maybe the model was too complex. And so did this additional feature didn't really add too much because it got washed out with all the other info. I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 I mean, there could be something like this going on. So it's definitely something that we see in the more complex models, which are going to have like kind of a harder training problem with more local optima and stuff. And it seems to just kind of get stuck in a place where the kind of like joint state of the the query model and the um, and the predictive model are such that it can't really informatively use the human, and it's in like a local optima where it, there's no like individual move to either of them that will make that situation better. Okay. Thank you. So when cost is zero, all of these methods should always ask the human. Why, why do, you, do you have an intuition for why the discriminative is still consistently doing worse? So I, for some reason, the, the value of information seems like the right way to, act, to me to ask, figure out whether I want to ask the human or not. Mm -hmm. But if, if I'm just always asking the human, I don't have a sense for why discriminative is, is still worse. Yeah. Um, so it's. So I, I, well, I think it is first worth pointing out that it's worse by a fairly small amount. You know, so if, if like the solid orange line versus the the green line is, is maybe not huge, but given that, yeah, th this is something I, I thought about a little bit. The the only explanation that I can think of is that architecturally, the way that I set this up um, for the for the decision theoretic approach to, to make sense, you really have to add a like a post hoc sort of calibration step to the to the neural network um, so that it's outputting something that is kind of a valid probability. And that's necessary to calculate expected utilities, um, but it might also be that it's it's legitimately like helpful at arriving at good predictions as well. And so the model is just a little bit better. Okay, thank you. Um, it, um, yeah, yeah, okay. I, I think that's, that's the most likely answer. Uh, so, so now um, the last couple slides here are showing not so much the, the raw accuracy, but trying to understand a little bit, you know, what's what's happening differently in when we, when we train the models in one way versus another, and, and why why these results um, come out the way that they do. Um, so. This, uh, so this plot is showing the galaxies you task. And now the, the plot on the left is, is showing um, the, the error of each model um, under each of the, the different classes of galaxies. And the plot on the right is showing um, the fraction of instances in each class that each model query. And the important thing here is that um, the galaxies you 
a task has a lot of class imbalance. So class one comprises, I think about 70% of the, of the instances. And, it, um, and it's also easier, right? So you can see um, that all of the methods have, have lower error on, on class one. Interestingly though, the purple bar, which is the human does not. So the human, so humans make errors almost at random, honestly, across the classes. Um, and um, and the, so they're not really phased by the harder or rarer classes to the same extent that the models are. So some of the models have quite high error rates on, on the rarer classes. Um, and, and this uh, gives you the, the kind of like arbitrage opportunity for the model, right? Um, so the model can, can be really good at class one because it sees a lot of instances of it, um, but it's not going to be able to distinguish very well between these rarer classes in, in two to five. And, um, and so then the, the right decision for the model is to try to basically identify those, those cases and, and query the human on those. So, um, so what we find is when we compare a little bit here, so this is looking just at the value of information approaches and then the, the differences between the, the fixed and the joint end-to-end -end training. Um, what we find is that the joint model has uh, different patterns of, of where it's more or less accurate. Um, so if you look at classes two and three, for example, here on the left-hand plot, the, the blue line or the blue bar is the error of the machine learning component of the, the fixed VOI. So this is without any human input, just what the model outputs. And the orange is uh, that same thing for the end-to-end -end trained model. And the bars kind of, you know, flip places, right, between classes two and three. So the, uh, so the, the fixed model is better at class three and the joint model is better at class two um, by um, a reasonably substantial margin. Um, and then we, we also noticed that the, um, that the joint model is more effective at shifting queries away from class one, basically. So if you look at the right hand plot, um, the joint model spends, spends you know, even fewer queries on class one and then in each of the other classes it manages to query more than the um, than the fixed model. Um, so I don't have a single concise explanation for why the model is doing better, but we think it's, it's some combination of these factors that it figures out how to shift the distribution of errors across classes around a little bit um, to make better use of the human. And then it also um, is, is more effective at recognizing which instances might require human input in the first place. So questions about this, this domain before we move on to the, to the other. So I think we've got about two minutes left to uh, summarize the other results. Um, so it, it should be a little bit quicker. Um, we, so we, we fit a decision tree here on the chameleon task to, to look for instances with human errors. And so this is kind of breaking down the input space into regions where the human is, is very accurate or, or regions where the human is not very accurate. And so there's this particular branch here, um, which is, um, you know, if you go left, then right, um, has, you know, 57% human errors. This is where, you know, the vast majority of the human errors on this task are concentrated in this particular region of the feature space. And here, um, basically, the the end to end trained model learns that it has to be really accurate there. So it, it correctly classifies all of those instances where the fixed model had, you know, more kind of uniform errors across the different regions. And then it pays for that elsewhere, right? The, the intent model is, is less accurate in other regions of the space. Um, but this, um, this gives the, the kind of trade-off that we, we were you know, motivating the project with, basically, that it's, it's managed to kind of adapt to you know, the benefits of being in a team. Okay, um, so that's, that's it for the talk. Um, I guess we're um, nearly out of time, so thanks for everyone for, for a lively discussion. But I'm also happy to stick around and answer any other questions. Awesome. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming and talking to us. I think this was, I really enjoyed this. I like thinking about the, the value of information and figuring out when and how to query the humans. I think that was very cool. So I am going to stop recording and broadcasting now. And then people who are, have time and would like to hang out, you are more than welcome to.